Back in October 2019, a friend and colleague asked that I consider joining an advocacy group, the HIV Advocacy Network. His selling point was that it would be a great way to meet men, but I knew his true motivation for asking. You see, almost every member of this newly revived coalition is under 35 years old. And while they are all unafraid and fiercely dedicated warriors, not one of them has had firsthand experience with the devastation suffered by the San Francisco gay community 40 years ago when AIDS decimated the city. And today, with 60% of those living with HIV and AIDS being over the age of 50, it might behoove these young folks to get to know on whose behalf they are advocating. You see, for most of their lives, HIV and AIDS has been a manageable chronic disease, like diabetes or lupus. A disease that can be managed by, in most cases, taking one or two prescriptions a day, every day, and thereby rendering the virus undetectable and untransmittable, as long as they continue the medical regimen as instructed. But for my generation... It was the plague that was killing everyone we knew and everyone we loved right before our very eyes. And nobody seemed to care. But I'm getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> Let's go back a bit to November 1978. Jimmy Carter was president. Anita Bryant started her crusade against the gays. We defeated the Briggs Initiative, which tried to prevent anyone who identified as homosexual from teaching in public schools. And in late November that year... 900 Americans, most of them from the Bay Area, committed mass suicide in Jonestown, Guyana, under the direction of cult leader, Reverend Jim Jones. And 10 days after that, we lost a local hero in a most violent manner. On November 27th, 1978, Supervisor Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone were assassinated. That evening, I found myself on the corner of Market and Castro with thousands of others. We looked to each other for comfort. We were drawn together by our shared grief. The air was bitter with sadness and shock and anger. But what transpired that night was nothing short of transcendental. With the lighting of one candle, followed by another, and another, and another, an impromptu candlelight march began to wind its way down Market Street towards City Hall. It was eerie quiet. The entire south side of Market Street filled with flickering candles and tear-stained faces. The silence broken only by an occasional sob or cry of disbelief. How could this be happening? Tell me this is not happening. At City Hall, Cleve Jones, Milk's young protege, climbed atop the granite steps and using Harvey's own megaphone, began speaking to the crowd. You know that saying by Maya Angelou that people don't remember what you say, but they always remember how you make them feel? It's like that. I don't remember a word Cleve said that night, not a single word. I do remember what I felt as I looked around the crowd, joined together, united in our grief. There were representatives from every group that made San Francisco the multicultural mecca it had become. We were black, white, brown. We were men and women. We were trans, gay, straight, old and young, rich and poor, immigrants and native-born alike. We were mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. All of our differences set aside, all of the intersectional squabbling suspended for the moment. We all wanted the same thing. Answers. And somehow, even though just a few hours earlier, he had been the first one to discover Harvey lying in a pool of blood, Cleve managed to keep it together. He managed to keep us calm and convince us not to burn City Hall down. Well, that night at least. And just as it had magically started, the candlelight march ended and we dispersed, each of us wondering what the future held. That was the night my inner activist was truly awakened. I was 15 years old. Three years later, we found out what the future held for us. My friends started dying. By the dozens. Some of them literally overnight. And no one was talking about it. The government wasn't talking about it. They certainly weren't doing anything about it. In fact, no one seemed to be doing anything about it. We were left to fend for ourselves. 
And so we did. We activated, we advocated, we acted out, and we acted up. And we took our cues from the anti-war and civil rights protests of the 60s and 70s. We marched, we petitioned, we rallied, we sat in, we died in, we kissed in, hell, we may have even fucked in. We took over government buildings. We snuck into and disrupted medical conferences. We held protests in the lobbies of corporations and government agencies. We bird dog politicians and lawmakers. Hell, we put a condom on a senator's house for Christ's sake. We stopped traffic in downtown San Francisco for five full days. Oh, and we made a quilt. A really, really big quilt. And when that failed to get everyone's attention, did we stop? Hell no. We started it all over again, more determined each time, rallying and organizing more and more people to the cause until it finally worked. Fast forward almost 40 years. It's January 2020. I've been selected to join a group of my fellow advocates and activists to represent San Francisco at AIDS Watch 2020. Each spring for the past 27 years, people living with HIV and AIDS and our allies and supporters gather together in Washington, D.C. for a two-day conference. During the first part of the conference, they attend skills building sessions, topical sessions discussing current needs and issues specific to people living with HIV and AIDS, and messaging seminars and how to effectively tell their stories so they have the greatest impact on their audience. The second part of the conference are the pre-scheduled in-person visits to representatives' offices on Capitol Hill, where we tell our stories face-to-face while asking for continued and increased funding for vital HIV programs and services. I was so excited to be seeing our nation's capital for the first time, and at the same time, being able to do some good for our community. This would be like my coming out as an elder for our community, something I had been resistant to acknowledging. That was until the novel coronavirus hit the United States, bringing us to our knees. Within 12 hours, everything I had been working towards for the past six months had been canceled or postponed. AIDS Watch was going virtual. Strategizing breakfast sessions on DuPont Circle would become Zoom room meetings in my living room. Messaging seminars turned into breakout rooms teaching us how to turn our flyers into tweets and our banners and posters into Instagram and Facebook posts. Our petitions were now being handled by some monkey named Survey. What was truly impressive was that within 10 days, the coordinators managed to turn this real-life conference for approximately 500 attendees into a virtual conference that reached 2,500 people. In one session, a woman who suffered from severe agoraphobia expressed her gratitude at finally being able to participate in the process. Ultimately, when all was said and done, this first-time virtual conference had become AIDS Watch's best attended in its 27-year history. But what if the most impactful part of AIDS Watch, those in-person Capitol Hill visits, our moment to show the human face of HIV and AIDS and the struggles we face daily to our Congress people? On the second day of the conference, a total of 28 conference calls were made to aides who represented numerous congressmen and women. During those conference calls, several of us told our stories of how living with HIV has impacted our lives and the importance of funding these programs and services. The average time on each call was about an hour. As I disconnected from my call, I began to wonder, did we have the same impact as we would have had we been able to tell our stories face to face? Were we able to express just how important funding these programs was to our continued well-being? Had we actually achieved our goal? And, more importantly, did Zoom have a sit-in function 